Awesome. Yeah, so um, this is just kind of going over the process of creating a server, um, the bare bones of like what a server looks like and how we can build it out. Um, what we could do first is let's go ahead and create a folder for our server. And you're going to see sometimes people will call it a, you'll have a server and then a client or a server and a source uh, in this case. So at the root of our project, we're just going to create um, a folder called server. You can do it. Yeah, you can do it in Visual Studio Code. If you just right click at the very, very bottom, um, you, you can click new folder and that will create it in the root. So yeah, this is where we're going to build our server folder. And then inside the server, we'll make an index.js. And we are on our way. Um, now, there's a, probably a few packages we don't have yet. So let's pull up our package.json and just see what we have um, and see what we need. All right, so um, some of the things that we are going to need is we'll need Express because we're going to build our server using it. Um, so Express is something we'll need. Uh, we're going to use something called .env, which is a package um, that allows us to use a .env file and not uh, save it in our package.json. So uh, we'll use express.env. Um, we're going to use sqlize. Um, so .env is actually spelled D-O-T-E-N-V. Yeah. There. Actually, it's a no dot. So it's D-O-T-E-N-V. Yep. That's the name of the package. And what we have to do before we start writing the package names is we have to say npm i because um, that's the command to install these packages in, inside of our uh, package.json. Perfect. And then after .env, uh, we are going to need sqlize, which is lowercase. Yeah, it's S-E-Q-U-E-L-I-Z-E. -E And yeah, perfect. And then that is, yeah, that's everything we need to start. So now while that's loading in the root of our project, so we right click at the bottom again of our file, we'll hit new file. And now we'll create a .env file. This is actually with the period this time. So period env. Okay. And then in our git ignore file, we're going to ignore this, the .env file. Uh, you'll see on 16 through 19, we have different levels of .env, but we just want the .env by itself, right? As you can leave those, but this is, this is explicitly saying, okay, I want you to ignore this file. Yep, just like that. Awesome. Now in the .env file, uh, the way we do our syntax here is on the left is going to be the um, the uh, variables, if we will. So it, like port is one of them, and it's going to always be all caps. So when we define the value, uh, the value will be equal to the all caps word. So we're going to be using port, and we'll say equals here and then we'll give it a value so four numbers um, actually so like f above 3000 so like 3001 or 4000 or whatever you want but it it's going to just say port equals the number we'll have no string no object nothing just the equal sign and the numbers just like that perfect now the next piece of our .env will be the connection string. So on line two, uh, let's go ahead and write the word connection underscore string, all caps. Remember for the when we write these words, and then underscores. Yeah. Yep. Yep. 
and this connection string is going to be the connection to our database. Do you have a database spun up yet? Gotcha. Is are you going to be using a Postgres database or a NoSQL database? Or uh, Postgres. Awesome. So so Postman is a testing. We'll get to that, but yeah. So uh, I'm gonna assume that it's gonna be the um a Postgres relational database. So let's let's spin one up real fast. It's actually really easy. Um, let's go to our web browser and open up a tab and go to heroku.com and sign in. And we are going to create a new, uh, if you don't have one already for your app, uh, we'll create a new, create new app name whatever your app is going to be look yeah just lowercase letters then create app button and then we're going to click on resources and then we're going to click on the add-ons bar and type in post um, and then it's going to be the Heroku Postgres and submit order form. It is a free thing, that's why we're using Heroku, because they'll spin one up for you. Now click on Heroku Postgres, and this is gonna open up your database. So this, this database now exists. Yep, and there's, if you click on settings, you click, you see your database credentials, you can click view credentials. And this is going to be all of the ways to connect to your database. So you have the five on the top. Uh, so you have host, database, user, port, password, and then you have the URI, right? Now we're going to just use the URI to connect. Um, so yeah, copy that. And then let's go to our uh, code. Yep. So this is the connection string. So we're going to do equals and paste in the connection string. So we have a database. We have a connection string that connects to the database. Now, let's see what that looks like exactly. So this connection string, literally all we need is someone who can translate our, our like a query language into, into something that this database would understand, and then the database will translate that and do stuff with it. So oh, go back to our web browser for a second. One of my favorites is called PG Web. So if you go and open a tab and type in PG Web, and then it should be that second one there. And if you'll see this is the first one where you have need all five, click on the scheme and then just paste in that key there. And that's basically what SQLize is gonna do. SQLize is going to be like, hey, I need your string, and then you can write queries, and now you can query your database. Now, this is your actual database. This is just a GUI. To, you know, it makes it look nice, right? Um, so we could, we could create tables here if we wanted to. We could, um, we can create all of your tables. We can um, add them and then you'll have tables in your database. Then we could insert data into those tables. Um, in fact, do you have your database model? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, see if you can find it. Did you do dbdiagram.io or dbdesigner? There's one of those. Yeah, it was this one. It was this one, yeah. Oh, 
Oh, awesome. Yeah, why don't you just, I don't know if you have two screens, but if you do, just pull it open link and it will open it up in like a tab for you. Um, and you can move it off to the side because we're, we'll need that to type in our query. So the, the query to create a table is just create table. So you can write that in your query here. Uh, it can be, it's it's up to you. Now, this is the syntax. If you're going to do capitalize, every keyword you use needs to be capitalized. If you're not, then everything needs to be lowercase, you know, just consistency, right? Mm, awesome. So the the immediate thing after create table is the name of the table. And so you'll do a space and name the table. And it's lowercase. And now after the table name, you're going to do parentheses. And in think Postgres, every time you see parentheses, it, there's columns now. And now you're going to define each column of the table. And you can give it a data type. Um, so the first one usually is ID. And that's a serial primary key. That works. Yeah, and you'll want underscores if there's going to be, or you could just do ID because each table will have its own ID, you know. Um, and this will be a serial primary key. So put a space after uh, ID and say serial. Uh, a, yeah, yeah, good. And then space primary key primary space key comma so columns are separated by commas and you have your next one yeah there's a way I always do my alters alter a table after I build the table I can't remember how to do it in line to be honest um, I think it's references but I'm not exactly sure. Um, yeah, I, I would just have to, I mean, let's just for now, instead of references, I'll show you how to do the alter table because that's what I'm comfortable with. Uh, but you'll put a space after user ID and give it a um, type, like if it's going to be an inter integer, uh, a Boolean. So instead of saying type, just put integer or Boolean, sorry. Uh, data type is what I was meaning to say there. So, yeah, integer, right? Awesome. And let's go whatever's next. Uh, correct. Yep. You can just leave it as it is. Now, after this, you're going to put a semicolon. Um, because that is going to say, okay, and then we finished that query. So um, you can run this query and it should save. And there you have a table called favorite list. If you click on that table, it will show nothing because nothing's in it. But if you click on the structure tab, uh, which is up near the top, you'll see the different columns and um, what data type they are. So let's... Yeah, we can add the, the other two as well. Uh, what we'll do is we can build something of a seed file. Um, so go to your query tab and let's just at the top above our create table, let's go ahead and write drop uh, table uh, and then we'll do a list here. So we'll say favorite underscore list. So no, parentheses mean columns, right? So in this case, we don't need parentheses. We just need a name of a table. And then put a semicolon at the end of this line. Now, what's going to happen if we run this? It will look like nothing happened. But what's happening is we are deleting the table favorite list. And then we're going to create the table favorite list. So what a seed file will allow us to do is basically nuke the database. Um, and, and we'll re refresh it. 
Now we're going to save all this code in our, we'll, we'll save it in our project um, just so that we have it on hand. Um, so we don't have to rewrite it. If something horrible happens, we have it on hand, <laughs> right? We don't have to rewrite all this. Yeah, you can run it if you want. So it looks like nothing happened, but it's just deleting and creating it again. So let's create let's create our other table, uh, or we can alter this table uh, if you'd like. What uh, whatever. Let's let's alter it then, um, because this now on line nine we can say alter table. And this is how we change a table after it's been created, right? So we're going to say alter space table, very similar to drop and create. And now we're going to reference the table we want to alter. And then if we want to reference a column, what do we need? Exactly. You need to type in user ID and it needs to be surrounded by parentheses because parentheses mean columns. So, so we're saying I want to alter the table favorite list in the column user ID. And what we'll say is we want it to reference. So it's going to, we're, we're going to use a keyword called references. And this is going to reference a specific table and a specific column. Now this is where we run into a problem. Th that table and column don't exist yet, right? Um, so this would break right now because we're, we need to reference. So maybe uh, let's just save this and then right after line eight, let's create our other table that we need to have. Um, no, no, I mean, don't delete it basically. Yeah, it, you can just keep typing in it. It'll, but let's uh, put enter after the create table and give us some space here. Now let's create our other table that this uh, favorite list needs to reference. Boom, every time, yep. Uh, you could say text, you could say a var char to limit the amount, um, but yeah, text will give us any char, yeah, just like that. And then if you do parentheses, parentheses, yeah, and then you can define the amount of characters they can have. Awesome. Then a uh, semicolon at the end of this query. And then we're going to uh, finish our alter table, right? Um, now we can reference a specific table first. Oh, when we say references, we want to reference the, 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 uh, the table. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. We're saying that we want um, we want the favorite list table specifically in the column of user underscore ID to to be changed, right? Um, actually, I think I'm uh, I'm missing something here. We need to add foreign key uh, before we click. We say references. Um, I'm pretty sure. I'll Google it just to double check on this. Yep. Yeah. So what that so what we're going to say here is that we are going to be looking at the 
uh, we're going to add a foreign key which is going to reference, wait, let me think about this. What table are we altering? Altering this table. We want to add a foreign key to what? Um, hmm. I feel like I'm mixing this up, this, this whole. Now, alter, alter table, add, add foreign key. Isn't that what it is? Or is it just foreign key? Oh, I've, I learned, I just, I googled it so I could figure, figure out exactly how we need to write it. But I also learned how to um, write it when you're creating table two. So you can say, um, you could put constraint, but I don't, I'm not familiar with, I don't usually use constraint. So we could say, awesome. Yeah, do that while I'm reading up on this. Yep, yep, yep. Foreign key. Okay. Is that a number one month price? Yeah, yeah. And you could do underscores between the words. Awesome. No, no, not at all. Yeah, you don't have to use them all. Awesome. Um, yeah, semicolon at the end. Now, we can use alter table. It's just instead of, I said, alter table, favorite list. And then we say, add foreign key to the column. And then we reference the table on ID. Or we can actually do it in line. Um, we would just put foreign key in front of the column in the uh, create table. So... Whichever way you want to do it, it, it pretty much work. It does work exactly the same. So I, I would say that you probably will put the foreign key in your create table. So uh, let's go ahead and uh, actually it's not on line four. It's actually on line f uh, on the line where the column is. So if you scroll up. Um, it's on line six and seven. Both will have the words foreign key in front of them. So foreign space key. And then parentheses around the column. Uh, just the, yeah, um, just the column name though. Uh, yeah. It's going to adopt the the value already from uh, the 
the user table. So you can drop integer and we can just say references. So now we're going to identify what table and column we're going to reference. Mm -hmm. uh, just ID, right? We're referencing the user table in the ID column, right? Um, and then products is very, it's pretty much the same syntax. We're just changing product. So foreign key in front of product underscore ID. And we're referencing products table ID column. Uh, not there. That's, that's a primary key. It's actually uh, on line, I think, seven. Yep. So that's a foreign key. And what our foreign key is saying is, hey, we're checking. So this column, products underscore ID, needs to have the same value as something inside of our products table in the ID column. Boom. Exactly. Yep. And then we can get rid of the alter table if it's there still. Yeah, because now they're built in line. And let's go ahead and run that query. We have a issue near user. So let, it didn't run. Let's, uh, the problem is currently we're saying on line six, hey, we want to reference the table user. The table user doesn't exist. So we got to move favorite list below both of our create tables because they're referencing tables that don't exist yet, right? Because they're existing in this order. So yeah, let's paste it at the bottom. Exactly. Yep. And it looks like we're having a user issue, which is line four, I'm pretty sure. But um, look, we could scroll down to our references and make sure. Yeah, it looks like we're referencing it, right? Try um, here, scroll up to the very top. Okay, we got favorite list. So I'm thinking it's either our create, try users with an S and then make sure to change, scroll down, make sure to change users there put a space between them maybe just in case yeah try running it now see if there's a problem with column user underscore ID referenced in foreign key constraint does not exist interesting well well, I think what it might be is this is like one of those um, syntactical. So what I was reading exactly was MySQL. And it could be the difference of like um, where MySQL, you can write foreign key in Postgres. It's like, well, we want you to put constraint in front possibly. So um, let me... Let me figure out what little slight. So basically, I think what's happening here is this works for MySQL, but not for Postgres. They're basically the same language. They just have very slight flavor differences. Like, oh, you have to say um, add or something silly like that. Um, Constraint. Hmm. 
let's do this. Um, copy lines 20 and 21 and just uh, cut them out. And then go ahead and type in those columns. So user underscore ID, integer, comma, product underscore ID, integer. Okay, and then let's go to 23 and do alter table. Favorite underscore list. Add. And just copy and, or just paste, sorry. And then uh, we'll just put that alter favorite ta that alter table favorite list add foreign key or I'm sorry alter table add foreign or add yeah up to that point just copy that again and paste it in front of line 24 yeah just copy that and paste it before everything on line 24 yep put a space and then put a semicolon at the end of each of these lines Yeah, yeah, we're ending these queries because these are separate queries, altering a table. Um, so these are doing, this is basically doing the same thing we were trying to do before. Um, we're adding a foreign key to the user column in the favorite list, right? Favorite, we're altering the table favorite list. We're adding a foreign key to the column user underscore ID, which is going to reference the user's table in the ID column. So, yeah, that that should that should be good. All right, column products. Is it supposed to be product? No, products. Oh, scroll down products uh, are column and when we say add foreign key to the column products underscore ID we're referencing the column in favorite list you'll see on 21 we actually call that column product so that's why it can't find it yeah there we go Exactly. Now let's go ahead and insert some dummy data into these. Um, we'll do enter. Um, yeah, and we can. Um, let's go ahead and just insert into user. Uh, let's do users. Yeah, users first. Insert into is the command or the the query language. And then we reference the table and then we have column or the parentheses for the columns. So we want to insert into our user underscore ID or I'm sorry, uh, it, username and password, right? Those are the only two, I think. Comma, comma to separate the columns. Yeah, and then password. And then the next thing is values. And then we do parentheses and we separate the values with commas. Now strings are single quotes in SQL queries, otherwise it will break. Mm -hmm. And you'll want single quotes for the strings. Awesome. Excellent. Now um, we can uh, run this query. And again, it's going to wipe everything and then add that user and click on the users table. And we have a user. Um, oh, that's why. Uh, the reason it didn't work is we didn't 
add our tables on the drop list. Um, so we got an error saying, hey, these tables already exist. So if we go to the very line one, on line one, we need to add users and products, comma, after favorite list. You can string them all together. Mm, just drop table, comma, um, you can put user, and you don't have to say drop table um, multiple times. You can just call it once and then put commas after each table. Yep. Products. And then semicolon. Perfect. And then if you run this now, this whole, f you know, each one of these. Well, uh, yeah, users, you need the S between the E, yeah. And then products. Oh, that is being weird. Hit. Try hitting insert on your keyboard. Yeah. Yeah, and now... Yeah, sometimes you, you hit a certain key and insert will fix that. Um... And then users table, if you click on it, uh, you'll see that one user that we just created with an ID of one. So this is what SQLize will do, right? We have our tables built and SQLize is going to make queries. It's gonna get our connection string just like PG Web did. And then we can write queries to our database using that connection string. Same that PG Web is doing. Um, so it's going to be built in, though, so that when someone clicks on a button, it does a certain thing and all of that jazz. So, so now we have, we have the starts of this, right? So let's go ahead and um, let's go back to our um, code. And we... Are, so we have a database, we have, oh, and let's save that file. I think I was going to, I said, let's save it somewhere. Let's create a folder called DB in our project um, in the root. Uh-huh, yep. A uh, new folder, and we'll call it DB. And then we'll make a file in here called seed.sql. Uh, L, just uh, SQL, yeah, there you go. And then we'll just copy that whole thing and paste it in here. So then we have the, yeah, in the query section. Uh, let's grab that whole query section, just uh, Command A or Control A, copy, paste it into our file here. And now we have it saved somewhere. So if something horrible goes wrong, you don't have to go back and write this all out. It's saved. So awesome. So let's go ahead and uh, we can close this. We're probably not going to need it anymore. Um, probably not going to need PG Web anymore, but we can just leave it up for now. Um, and then in our index.js, let's build a server and connect it to SQLize. Um, so the first thing we'll do is we're going to say, hey, .env, we need you. So normally you're used to saying const and you're going to set it equal to a variable or and you might be used to saying import as well. Um, no, Node.js does allow import, import to be used um, with extensions called MJS. But uh, what we have students typically do is the using their default or their original, which is using require. Um, so if you say require here, you can require your packages and we're going to, so requires a function and we invoke that function and then we can reference our, our, uh, packages with a string. So we could put a string here and say dot env, uh, the word D O T E N V, because this is the package that we're saying, Hey, we, we require you now. What this does is saying, hey, this whole file, index.js, now has uh, .env, the package, being run on it. Uh, so if we write a command called .config after this invocation of require, what 
dot config will do is it will make it so that everything in our dot env and invoke config because that's also a function. Um, no, you're you're right. So dot config invoke. So just parentheses at the end there. Oh, I'm I mean uh, instead of quotes uh, parentheses. So uh, put dot config at the end just like you have. Yeah, there you go. And so if you hover over config, you'll see what this is telling you now. It's saying, hey, this is going to load your .env file contents into HTTPS. What does that mean? Well, it gives you an example on that second line at the very end. It says, hey, the key equals value becomes parsed like this. It says key now is equal to the actual value. And that lives on something called the process.env. So if you go ahead and you, let's go ahead and um, on line two, um, go ahead and type in um, process.in, or let's uh, console.log this actually. Uh, console.log uh, invoked process.env. Oh, sorry. Period env, yeah. Uh, the dot, yeah. And you'll notice here, like this, an example of what that object looks like. Now, at the very end of this process.env will be any of things that you created in your env file. So it's just an object with a bunch of uh, properties on it. That's all that process.env is. Uh, you'll see how it it shows there it's just an object here. So if we go ahead and run node now here in this uh, server, we could the way we can do that is we can say uh, node space server forward slash index.js. So now it ran this file and remember what node does, it's going to immediately exit if it doesn't have, so it ran this file and then it finished. So if you open your terminal up a bit bigger, so you can maybe see this a little more friendly, like um, this is kind process.env has quite a bit on it, but you'll notice it has um, also it has whatever you added on the .env, right? So one of those things you called port and one of them you called connection string. And you'll notice connection strings on this and so is port. So the it's in the C's near the top. Keep keep going, keep going. Yeah, there it is. Yep. Yeah. So what this is doing? Why do we need dot env? Because it's protecting this string, right? This connection string, literally, if I have it, I can copy and paste it into anything, any GUI, like PG Web. I can go to PG Web, copy and paste this connection string, and query your database. I could do delete table and name each of your tables and then hit enter and then sign out and be on my way. It just deletes your database, right? Um, I could query and say select all users um, and copy all that data. So that's why we want to protect our connection strings. Um, it's something that is, um, it's, yeah, it's one of those things that we want to protect. So that's why a .env, uh, this package in particular is pretty popular and um, pretty widely used. So, so it's just an object, right? Process.env is an object. So if you just said dot connection underscore string, you would just get the string back which is what we're going to do. Um, so on line two, instead, we can, instead of console logging it, we can um, destructure an object by using curly braces. So instead of console log, let's just do const um, curly braces. And inside the curly braces, we'll call the properties from the object that we want. So specifically, port comma connection string and we'll want we'll want these 
case sensitive, right? So they'll need to be capitalized. And then also instead of square brackets, you need the curly brackets because this is destructuring an object. And all caps, everything has to be caps. Mm -hmm. And it's connection underscore string. And you may have not seen this before, and so I kind of want to get you used to it in case you haven't. So we're going to set that equal to the object. Um, so process.env. So what is happening here? What we are doing is we're saying, hey, I am going to declare a variable port. It is an inside of an object called process.env. So process, basically what we're saying is port has to be a property on the object located at process.env. And what, whatever that property is, I want the value of it when I call it later. So if you console log port now um, below, you will just get the port. And it's got to be case sensitive. Yep. And so you see it highlights. And then if you console log connection string, you will just get the value behind the connection string. Yeah, and to run this, you say node, yep, at server forward slash index.js. And there you get you get the exact values that were in our our env file but they're protected so if someone read this file they don't get access to it right well the specifically it's two things the env package is saving it um not saving it but it's it's hiding it and it's grabbing it from a env file the second thing that's protecting it is your git ignore because your git ignore is saying, hey, git is not watching anything in the .env file. So it's literally not being saved. So if you upload anything to GitHub, this .env file will not exist. So if someone tried to copy your, your code from, dot, from GitHub or, you know, forked it and, you know, copied your code, they, it wouldn't work unless they inserted a .env file, put their own values for that .env file. They can see that you're using .env here, but they don't know what your connection string is and they don't know what your port is. Awesome. All right, so we understand what the .env package is doing, um, which is great, we're, we're on our way. So let's go ahead and build the next piece out. Uh, we need Express. Express is the one that's going to be handling our routes. Um, it's going to be handling our server. Also, uh, while we're doing this, let's go ahead and npmi nodemon. Because what we've been using is we've been typing in node. So npmi nodemon, perfect. Nope, yeah, just, just like that, yep. Now. The reason we like nodemon is because now we don't have to type in node for <laughs> node server forward slash index.js every time we want something done. Now we can just say, hey, nodemon run. And every time we make changes to a file, it's going to check uh, if they're, you know, it's going to refresh. So let's do nodemon in our, uh, in our terminal here and say nodemon, and we want nodemon to watch uh, it's E, N O D E M O N. Uh, sorry, uh, the, the node mon, yeah, that part, perfect. And so we'll want to say node mon, we want you to look at server forward slash index.js file, right? Awesome. Now it's waiting for info, right? It ran the file and now it's waiting for changes before it restarts. So um, I want to point something out. Uh, before we said we were using require instead of import, and I mentioned you can use import on a certain extension. And you'll notice nodemon says watching extensions, JS, MJS, and JSON. 
MJS is the file, the extension for that import. So if you were to use the import keyword instead of the require, you would have to have a .mjs file. Um, Nodemon doesn't care, but I just wanted to remind you of what that was and uh, just remind you that Node does use uh, imports now. Uh, that has to be used with an MJS extension, but just a brief reminder. All right. So uh, let's close our package.json. We can close our .env. We're not going to need either of those. We can close the seed too if you wanted. Um, now, we don't need our console.logs, but what we do need is we need to have express on this file. Now, what we do is we're going to say const express is equal to require the express package. And require is a function. We require invoked. And then the package is described in a string form. So uh, double quotes is fine and express. Sorry, uh, just the name of the package, which is ex the, the name of the package is express. Perfect. So now express the file or the, the variable is equal to the package express. Now, something you might see quite a bit is right after this line, People will say, all right, I am going to make app. So const app is equal to uh, lowercase a, usually, typically, is equ equal to express invoked. So now we're invoking whatever express, whichever the package was, right? Um, and then you'll see a few more things uh, typically, right? So we will now want our um, cores to be required. Um, this opens quite a few doors here. So let's, how about let's get the basics maybe. Um, sorry, before I have you do everything here. Um, let's go ahead. There's a few things that Express gives us. Now, when I say app, I'm really saying Express, right? Because we set it on line four. So a few of these methods that app gives us or express is set. You might have seen app.set, app.use, app.get, post, put, delete, and finally app.listen. So these are all things that express gives us. So to really set up the bare basics, let's just put up an app.listen for now. Um, and this is going to listen to a specific port. So it invoke listen. It, listen is a function, and we invoke that. And you'll notice that it takes in primarily the first, it needs a port as an argument. So uh, let's just give it the variable port because we've already defined that somewhere in our .env. And then comma after this, and we can actually put in a, a callback. Um, you'll see here it tells us. What what we could do here is make an anonymous arrow function. So just uh, parentheses, arrow, curly braces. And what we can say here is like, all right, so uh, when you're listening, we want to uh, do curly braces here. And, the, and what we could say is, hey, what we want you to do is console.log when you fire. Console.log... Uh, and you'll see people do all sorts of messages like working on port, whatever. Uh, you could do a template string or a string literal, I think is what it's called. And you'll need to do, if it's a, because this will print to the, yeah, so you back ticks. If, yeah, if you're going to do a string, uh, you can do double quotes, but it looks like you're using curlies. Um, and uh, you could put port here. Uh-huh. Yeah, that yeah, it yeah, it's a dollar sign in front of the curlies. And you need the back ticks if you're gonna be doing this. So that's why I had you do them. Uh so put port, we're calling the variable here. Um and so now you'll see it in your console. Or in your terminal rather. Yep. Awesome. Now, again, no one can know what this number is, right? Because they only see the variable, or they only see the, the word port, 
and they don't have a .env because it's not being tracked by Git. So that's just a reminder of that. So we currently have an app.listen, which is listening on this port. Um, it's waiting for a call. Now let's go ahead and put some space between four and five here. And let's let's get some practice with some other um, other methods that express as. So let's go ahead and do an app.use. Now a use method is middleware. It's always going to run on this file. Um, so it's it's running in order from top to bottom. So if you have an app.use on five and eight, it will run first on five, then on eight. Um, so so something typical we'll see here is an express.json inside of an app.use. Uh, express.json invoked. JSON is a function that's going to basically convert our text um, and parse it uh, in a way that makes and tells you right there. Yep. Um, so it's basically making things work, uh, <laughs> essentially, making sure that we have information that we can read. Um, and then something else you'll typically see is app.use, and we will use cores. And cores is something that basically allows for our, um, it, it deals with specific syntaxes in when you send requests uh, the reason it's currently breaking is because we actually have to require it, uh, which was what I was going to have you do above on, and I haven't had you do it. So we'll go ahead and invoke it, because it will be a function that we invoke. And then on line after line four, let's, or up there, either way, no, just somewhere at the top, const cores equals require cores. And then requires a function that is invoked. And then the package is destructured by double quotes. Uh-huh. Yep. And yep, exactly. Awesome. Uh-huh. And it's a package. Um, so let's go ahead. We can install that. Um, yeah, we can kill this if we want Yeah, and install NPMI cores. I, I, you need the I in there because I stands for install. There we go. And that will work. And we'll say nodemon wants to, to watch our server folder in our index file. Again, we'll have nodemon running again. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, we're watching. Now, let's pause here for a second. The reason why why does Nodemon need to know the folder and the file? Well, it's because if you, we look at our path in the right above that line, we're in desktop, dev, dev M, capstone demo, Amazon tracker. So that's all that it knows we're at. So Nodemon needs us to dig down more from that level to the server. Um, and that's that's what we're feeding it. Yeah. Yes, definitely. Another thing you can do also in the package.json is make a main. And when you just say nodemon, nodemon will look for main. Um, and that's another another way to make things faster. So it's actually, it would be on like line five, like after private, you just put a, uh, so yeah, just make a new property called main in double quotes, because this is JSON and then colon and then we'll reference the file path. So for uh, this is in double quotes, server forward slash index dot JS. Awesome. And then go ahead and let's go put a comma at the end of main. That's why it's breaking. Yeah. And then if you kill it and you just run nodemon, 
it will automatically work. Yeah, awesome. All right, so we currently have Express working here, and it's listening um, for requests. And requests might seem a lot uh, more, a lot simpler, uh, but they're just those get that we have the methods dot get dot post dot put dot delete right. Um, and you can just uh, comment them out uh, if you'd like to start. But let's uh, let's go ahead and make an app dot get to start. Uh, or or let's actually let's uh, maybe let's do post uh, like if we want to register a user. Um, and it's actually lowercase. It's app dot post lowercase and post is a function and you'll see it takes in a path um, which is just a string like a, a route so we'll do a, the first argument is a string and we do uh, normally I'll have people do forward slash API forward slash whatever defines this let's uh, register a user so uh, forward slash API uh-huh and then forward slash, whatever you want to call it. Now, uh, this will be creating a user is the point of this endpoint. Um, so let's put a comma after this uh, because there's the second argument, which is the handler. What's going to happen when this route is hit? Well, um, we don't have that built out quite yet. And let's go ahead and, um, yeah, exactly. We're going to build a controller file that's going to handle this. And if you'd like, later you can do all sorts of uh, building out with this too. Um, let's let's go ahead and make a controller file and um, or even folder. It's up to you if you want a whole folder for controllers. Um, but if you just want one, just do controller.js. And I am going, just for syntax, I'm going to send you... Um, I think I'll send you like some boilerplate. Let me find, actually, if you go to the, um, go back to, uh, you're on GitHub, go to the, um, general chat. Yeah. Yeah, and then click on the solution code for the lab. It's that last one. Yeah, and go ahead and grab that file. And then open that guy up. And we want the server and the controller. open and what we really want you can grab all of this if you want um, but what we really care about is um, the 6 through 13 the most well and I guess 1 through 13 wouldn't hurt because you already have you'd have all that so so that's the boilerplate stuff that I like to just get um, for students. Um, the other thing is the mod. Yeah, the, yeah, we'll, we'll actually build out our own version of this. Um, you can grab, you can grab that all if you want and just paste it below. Um, yeah, you can just copy it all and paste it over if you'd like. And why don't we just do this? Get rid of 15 to start. You won't need line 15 at all. And then let's get rid of lines 24 through, just go down, keep going, yeah, to 80. Awesome. Awesome. All right. So this is a little more digestible. Um, let's go ahead and scroll up to the top and let's walk through what's going on here. Uh, line one looks familiar, does it not? Um, uh-huh. We're requiring the .env package, 
which creates a process.env uh, which ex accesses the values that we had in our .env file. This is specifically needing our connection string for this file uh, because SQLize is going to be our communicator to our database, um, and which is why we need 6 through 13. 6 through 13 is what creates an instance of that connection, right? So our, so basically everything to the right of the equal sign, that new SQLize needs a connection string and says, hey, this is going to be Postgres and all this other stuff. All of that is equal to our, our connection. So now when we say SQLize, we are literally calling the connection that exists. So you'll notice what's happening. Um, well, let's let's first uh, dig through what module.exports is. This is module.exports on 16 is saying, hey, what will be sent out of this file is the following object. With one property, that property has a function on it. So if I said uh, controller, if I said, uh, if we go back to our index.js, and let's go ahead and import controller.js on, yeah, like using const, right? Const, we'll call the file whatever we want. Probably controller. Yeah. And that's equal to, and then we require the file. Similar, yeah. Um, yeah, um, it needs the dot forward slash, kind of like what you're used to, though, because it's a file, it's not a package, right? Forward slash, yeah, there you go. And yeah, it just doubled up, you just get rid of that last part. Boom. So now, controller is going to be equal to the object, right? That only has that one property. Now let's rename that uh, property from, I think it was like get all, uh, you can open up. Why don't you grab your controller file and drag it to the right? And so we can have a, like a right to left look. So instead of get all clients, let's change this to something more appropriate. We're adding a user, right? We're creating an account. It's not a get, this is a post. So uh, you could, yeah, you could post user. That's fine. Yep. Yeah. Now, let's go ahead and you'll notice the query that they have here is select all from... Now, it, this is just SQL now, right? It says select everything, all columns, from cc underscore clients table. C. Now that C isn't called an alias. What it means is later on, if I reference C, I'm referencing the table CC underscore clients. All right, so the next piece of this says join. I want to join the CC underscore users table, U, alias. So now we're going to say, okay, so we're selecting everything from this table, and we're joining it with this table on and we're joining it on the c dot user underscore id equals u dot user underscore id. So what that's referencing is two different tables and two different columns, right? With the aliases that they used. So this is just SQL, right? SQL query right here, and we're we're familiar with what that is. And um, I just want you not to be afraid of that at all. And we're using something called dot query, which is built into SQLize. And we can just literally paste in a query here. So why don't we just to start, um, let's, um, let's think about what we need to do with this. So if I'm creating a user, I probably just need a user name and a password, right? So we'll need to, uh, very similar to what we did in our seed, actually, right? Because we created a user in our seed. So we could probably go back to our seed and copy and paste that into the this section here. 
Mm -hmm. It's the insert into, right? Yeah, it's literally that. That is what we need in our query. Uh, put it inside in those back ticks for the SQLize.query. Uh, get rid of it. Yeah, we're not. We don't want to select all from these tables because we don't have those tables. Yeah, let's just. Now the only problem that we're facing with this right now is that we do not want nobody and password to always be passed in. We want something else. So we're gonna use that dollar sign curly brace to um yeah. So we'll do two dollar sign curly braces, right? And then comma dollar sign curly brace. We'll need variables here. But we also need the values. The you know, because these we want whatever they typed in. Yeah, so we'll yeah, let's do user perfect. Yep. But now we need that to be defined too. So let's let's go above our SQLize.query. Uh, in on line 17, below line 17, above line 18. Yeah. And let's go ahead and destructure um, something from the request object. Um, we're going to destructure the rec.body. So we're going to say const curly braces. And then we'll say username, comma, password is equal to rec.body. Now, uh, yeah, rec.body, perfect. So rec.body is a, it's, it's an object, right? It's got, and we're expecting a property called username on it and a property called password on it. Um, and so now those will be passed to us from the front end. Um, now the second thing, uh, the last thing I think we need is on line nine of our index.js, we actually need this function to be fired when they hit this route. Uh, nine of at, uh, the index.js though. So we have this post request. Uh, go ahead and put some space between this post and the dot use by the way, while we're here. Um, yeah, the line eight. Yeah, give us some space here because those are different. We'll separate them. So we'll have first, this is the route that needs to be hit. And then comma, this is the function that needs to be run when the when this is hit. And so we can reference this function by calling controller, the variable on line six, which is a object. So we can use dot notation to dig into the property post users, right? Yep, dot post users, yep. Controllers line six. Awesome. So we are still breaking though. Uh, let's take a look at what our terminal is saying because it doesn't like something and we're not sure what that is. Uh, hit RS and hit enter. This is going to restart Nodemon. All right, so let's scroll up to the top here. It's saying, um, Please install module name package manually. Oh, I forgot. There's some because we're using we're we're using some other things that I forgot to have us install. Um, we need to install. It says you'll notice at the top here of that error. It says please install pg package manually. So we need to install, install PG. Yep. Because this is another package that is allowing us to write these queries. Um, now let's go ahead and run Nodemon. 
Remember, we just write node mon now and see if this is working. It awesome. Now we can we can test to see if this works. Um, what what we're expecting back is a res dot status two hundred, and it's going to send us uh, the response, um, and that's on line twenty three, right? So after our query runs, we want a res dot status two hundred send db res at index zero. Now, what you should know about SQLize is it's going to send an array with two indexes, index zero and index one. Index one will be some metadata, and index zero will be, from what I understand, whatever you asked back, which we technically haven't asked anything back, so it should be nothing. Um, but that's okay. Let's go ahead and try it though. Uh, we can use Postman. Uh, you can use something called Thunder Client in VS Code. I don't care. Both work. So the big question, how do we hit this, right? This particular API. Uh, that I think the connection string you're looking for is in your .env. What is that for specifically? That's for your database. Yep. Yep. Your server is currently listening on port. Uh-huh. Yeah, um, great question. You can hit it uh, using Postman. You can hit it with your web browser. Now, the problem with hitting it in the web browser is it's kind of hard when it's a post because a post ex specifically is expecting data to be sent. Um, yeah, so you can, you can run it, but it's going to run a get, right? Like a post isn't going to, we can't send data this way, unfortunately. Not yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's, I'm going to have you do something first, though, uh, to get you ni a nice structure going. So go ahead and click on the top left underneath the red or the orange postman sign is this little note thing. It's called a collection. It's below. And then hit the plus sign. We're going to create a collection for your project. So go ahead and name this whatever you want and Command S or Control S. And then you can right click on this. Uh, uh, off to the left, you can add a new request. Um, and now name this request. We're gonna add a user or whatever you wanna call it. Great, and then let's change this from a get to a post. And then this is the URL and it's HTTP colon forward slash slash. localhost yep perfect and now it's forward slash whatever your route is uh, api forward slash perfect now there are some pieces here i'm going to have i'm going to show you i'm going to walk through but I'm just going to kind of show you what we need to do to add something to the body to a request using Postman. Um, we will walk through how to do this on the front end uh, so you can see how an Axios request looks and sending something on the body. Uh, but here, there's a simple tab that call, that's called body right underneath the, the uh, URL area. And we'll click on raw tab. Which, and then it says text off to the right now. Change text to JSON. It's just easier to send. And then make an object here. Um, and in this object, we'll make two properties. One's called username and one's called password. Uh, but you'll need to put these in an object. So curly braces. And then, yep. Oh, you could, no, you could just yeah, username double quotes because this is JSON. 
username colon after the username and then the value that is going to be behind. Perfect. And then a comma after uh, the this. Uh, it's still inside the same object though because the body is just one object. Um, and then we'll do uh, no, we're not going to do another set of curlies, just one set of curlies. And then we'll do our next property. Yep. And this would be password, correct. Uh, good. Awesome. So now our it's all set to go. Let's see if it works. Let's click send, see what happens. It should. Yes, um, unless username has a unique constraint, which I don't believe it does currently. It looks like it's breaking though. Uh, it doesn't seem like we're hit, we're, so when it spins, so let's go back to our code and we'll see in the terminal of our code that there's some sort of error. Let's open this up a bit bigger and scroll up uh, to the very top and see what it gives us to start. It says at the very top, Executing insert into values. Let me password. Hmm. Yeah, that is kind of interesting. Why is... Here, uh, let's go to our controller.js for a second and just take a look at our SQL query that we wrote. Let's put, um, okay, we have our columns. Put a, put a space between users and our columns. Um, I don't think it would be something like that, but I'm just curious if it, uh, line 21 in our query. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you need to just get rid of a zero there. Yeah, and currently it's it says cannot get. Now the reason for that is because we are if we open up our index.js, we currently don't have a get request running. Well, go ahead on on line ten. I want you to do something. Line ten, write an app dot get. Uh, make it just forward slash for the route. So it's a string though. So it's a string forward slash. So what this means is basically if they just hit localhost port, then comma, put a comma after this. And then we're going to do a anonymous arrow function. Or heck, let's, uh, we could do, um, let's just do a string. No, no, that will probably break. Let's just do a, yeah, anonymous arrow function here. <laughs> um, yep, go ahead and do curly braces at the end um, of this. And then we're going to go ahead and inside the parentheses of our anonymous arrow function, the parentheses will have a rec, comma, res. And then in the curly braces, let's go ahead and just say, res dot send invoked because send is a function and we're going to send a string of whatever you want and go ahead and get it now from your browser there you go so 
So now the get request is sending something back. Because, yeah, we're hitting this, and it's specifically, it's SQLize, is not liking our syntax. Um, scroll down and restart the, uh, the our server, if it hasn't been restarted. Okay, and we changed one thing. I'm going to have you try it, and let's see if it, if it works in Postman. Nope. So we got the same error, I assume, but let's check and double check that. Oh, uh, you know what? There might be one more thing that we need to install. Uh, it's coming from Postman. Oh. Yeah, wait, scroll. Uh, that's interesting. Insert user's username password forward slash n. Oh, here, let's uh go back to your, um, you see how it says there in the SQL section? Uh, open up your terminal a bit bigger. You see how it says insert into users username comma password forward slash or backslash n. I think it's because we have that space. Let's get rid of that and just see if that is what's tripping it up. So let's uh, backspace values all the way back. Uh, 22 at the beginning. Yeah, let's let's just basically go back to yeah there we go yeah and put a space again between them there we go and now let's let's see if that's what it was if it was messing it up it's still not working is it got did it get rid of that end though it did okay is it the same error And let me double check if there was a Yeah, I th I think it's um I think it might have been a package out. Here go back to the uh Discord uh, general channel and click on the lab instructions tab or yeah link I think there's a specific thing I had oh there it is let's try that so you see that line where it says step 2 SQLize and the first step install SQLize PG and PGH store try installing PGH store um, I think that might have been it um, All right, let's give that a shot and see if that's what it was. It was uh, we need to start our backend though, because currently it's not running. All right, is this, looks like it's still giving us an error. Same error. Yeah, that's that's interesting.
And I think I'm pretty confident that this is exactly, it's all lowercase, username, password. Here, open up your seed file again. Let's just double check. Um, scroll up to yeah, username, password are the columns. We have our, if we go to the controller.js, we do have the semicolon at the end killing it, I believe. Uh, if you go over to the right just a bit. Uh, put it after the orange parenthesis before, yeah, yeah. Uh, after or like before after the parenthesis before the um yeah back tick okay so we have that we have the users table we have the values i'm confused as to why you keep trying to find how to insert into using I wonder if they have a, um, oh, interesting. Yeah, um, Just found someone writing, um, putting, see they have back ticks here, just like we do. They have the column names, values, and then they have um, a round username and password. They have string, uh, you just do the single uh, quotes around each of those values. No, not there. Those are the back ticks. We need those around the the username and password uh, dollar signs. Yeah. Yep. Around the whole thing, do a single quote. Sometimes it's just a syntactical thing. Like uh, each one will need an opening and closing um, from what I'm seeing. I'm going to take a look also at the, uh, see if they... Did uh, did we have an example from, anyway, we could try this. If this doesn't work, what I wanna do next is look at the uh, example code that we had from the solution and just see what syntax we need to do, but hopefully this fixes it. So let's give it a shot. <laughs> hey, uh, scroll down to the very bottom of your terminal. Yep, there you go. Yeah, so it's just intact. Um, basically those double quotes are, double quotes mean something and I forget what it means, but I think it selects a table. Go go to PG Web for a second uh, in the browser, and if we put double quotes around, uh, 
put double quotes around nobody instead of the single and run the query. Yep, same error. And that's because we're sending a JSON up and it's in double quotes initially. So awesome. <laughs> yeah now let's check if we look at our post post uh, PG web uh, we can see that user being added to our database it's kind of hard to tell but um, <laughs> It's <laughs> awesome. Uh, it will take its time getting it, but you could refresh. It'll be faster, probably. Yeah, this is where we write our queries, right? So this is this is just what we write. So you can actually get rid of all that stuff because you have that saved. But yeah, you, it's it's code that you have written in your seed.sql file. So so a user is being created. Uh, it's being stored in the database. Uh huh. Yep, that. Yep, that is right. Now, if we wanted to send back, let's say they sign in, and we want to return the user, right? We want we want to uh, now. Wait, pause. Everything you're doing. So this is this is a common habit that I see a lot of new students come in and do. Once you've created a route, you do not touch it. You, you leave it. So put it back to a post and save and then click back. Um, yeah, go ahead and s you, you can click the save button or command or control S. Um, it's, well, it's actually up above your URL area. Um, it's to the right. Yeah, that button. But now, so once we're done with this, we right click on Amazon Tracker and we add a new request if we want to do something else. And we, na we name it, we do what we want here. Um, this way we can go back if we've messed something up and we've saved our progress, right? Um, yeah, so now we want to get a user. But we can also write it all into the same endpoint technically. Because what we're doing, um, and I'll show you, I'm, I'll show you this in the one we're doing right now. So let's go back to our code for a second. We can actually have the user sent up in this. Um, currently, we're we're saying, hey, we want you to send the results of the SQLize.query. But let's do this instead. Let's say, hey, I want to um, let's create a variable, say const on like nine nineteen. Um, we could say const, um, let's say, um, what this will, the query that we're going to write, what it's going to do and what it's going to return is, uh, the user. So you can call this whatever you want, but that's what this will be. The variable we're creating It'll be the user's information. And then we would set. Perfect. And we're going to set this variable user equal to a query. So we'll say SQLize.query invoke that. And then we write our query. Um, now we could say um, so backticks. We're going to need backticks. Um, what we could say is um, 
select to all, right? Because we could we could use that. And it's the splat or the star uh, is the all instead of typing all. Yep. Select all from. And then you name the table. I think it's with an S. Um, yeah. Sure. Um, and it's just ID. Or, I'm uh, sorry, no, it's whatever you want it to be. Um, select all from users. Um, and most of the time you'll say where here. Um, you'll, you'll, um, because you're specifying a specific one. Because select all from users is going to grab everyone, right? And then you want to specify uh, with the keyword where something is equal to something, usually. Well, um, what they've typed in is saved currently on line 18, right? They have two things that they're giving you. They're giving you a username and a password. So you can either pick one or the other, or both. It's up to you. So what you're going to reference is when you say where, you're going to reference a column. And then you're going to set it equal to a thing, uh, like a, a value. Username. Mm -hmm. So where username is equal to a specific value. Yeah, exactly. Except uh, we'll make it modular, able to use many, yeah, with the curly brace. And it's a dollar sign in front. And then it's, uh, so it's it's going to be the single quotes, dollar sign, yeah. And then it's username, though, because username is our variable, which represents for whatever they've typed in. Ending that with that. Perfect. And then end the whole thing with a semicolon. And then we don't want the user underscore ID, actually. And then put the back tick after the semicolon. Put that back. Perfect. So this is another way to write queries. Um, you assign a query to a specific variable. And then you can send that variable back up. Now, remember, SQLize will send back an array of two indexes, index 0, index 1. Um, but let's just take a look at it. And also, um, there's also another thing that we need to be concerned about. A SQLize, when we connect to our database, what happens when we run this? I'm going to just walk through it. First, the index is hit. The index is being run. Someone hit the post. OK, they hit this route. We're going to run the post users function. The first thing that happens, we have a request object and a response object. Second thing, we have on line 18, we're declaring a variable called username, which should be a property on the request.body object. We should have a password, which is on the request.body object. These two properties should have values. Then the second thing is we're running 19, we're declaring users, and we're running a SQLize query. And what the query gives back initially is a promise. And it says, hey, I will get that to you. I promise. So let's go ahead and console.log what that looks like on 20. Uh, console log users.
I just want you to know what this looks like. Yeah, and then go ahead and uh, let's hit this endpoint. Um, uh-huh, yep, uh, the post, oh, we're hitting the post. Uh, you can click on add user and just run that one, yeah. Awesome. So this is what we're seeing. You see that promise? That is literally what users is equal to. It's it's worthless. It's an IOU. It's not something, it's breaking our code. And so that is something to understand. If we write queries like this on line 19, where we set it equal to a variable, we need a way to make sure that we don't get a promise back. We need the value. <laughs> we need whatever the result of the promise is. Like, hey, I don't want that. I'll get that to you. I want the value of what it is. And so what we can make is an asynchronous uh, function and await the response. So in front of the rec res on line 17, we make this async uh, in front of it. We just write the word, the keyword async. Uh, it's, yeah, it's A-S-Y-N-C. Yep. And then in front of the thing we want to await, we're going to put await. So we put it right in front of the SQLize word. Now let's run this again and see what we get. Awesome. So again, users should be bring back two, it should be an array with two different, um, you can make this bigger because this is, uh, yeah, it's kind of a big thing, but you'll notice it's an array with the square brackets and it's got two indexes. For the first index, we have an array of objects. And for the second index, we have this result object. This is the metadata I was talking about. Um, now, you'll notice this is kind of an edge case, but we kind of have a problem. We have two users with the same username. Um, so that's, uh, we're, we're bringing back both of their, their data. Um, a great way to reset this, because we don't want that to happen, is we could go back to our seed file. Um, in fact, while we're in our seed file, go ahead and change line four on your seed file to user with just an, and then uh, change it on line 23 to user at the very end of line 23. And then change it on 26 to user. Um, and let's give it a shot. I, I think we fixed whatever it was in the past, but user makes more sense. So let's copy that whole seed file and nuke our database um, in PG web. So we don't have multiple of the same. Go to qu query, uh, go to the query section and paste this query in and run it. At or near user. I guess it just doesn't like user. That makes no sense. I don't think I've ever had a problem with that. Mm. All right, well, whatever. Uh, you can just undo those changes in the seed file on your, yeah. <laughs> that heart attack moment. Um, <laughs> no come back. Yeah, let's just copy this again, paste it in PG web. That's a bummer. I was thinking that it would be fine, but I guess user is a keyword for Postgres. Run that query. Okay, so we have no duplicate users. Now, something we can change though in our seed file right now is we can make a constraint. Um, if we go back to our query section, we can actually make a constraint in that create table for our users table. So scroll up and users for username, we could put the unique keyword in front of username after username and we'll put unique um, and unique prevents anyone doing the same value. 
So you only will, so you only have one of the same users. So go ahead and run that query. Uh, maybe it goes after Varchar. Maybe I'm wrong. I think it goes after Varchar then. Yeah, there we go. So uh, let's go ahead and cut everything above our insert into. Uh, scroll down and get rid of all those alter tables, everything above insert into. Uh, just keep the insert into because we're going to test this and make sure it's working. Yeah, yep, just delete it and run query because this shouldn't work. Boom. Now, this is something to keep in mind. Just because we have a constraint in our database does not mean that a user knows you know, that there's a constraint in the database. Um, a query will be attempted to be run in the back end and we will get an error from the back end. We will need to communicate that somehow to the front end. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. Yeah, so Exactly, something like that, right? Sorry, this username's taken, please try again or something. Um, we need to return that value back to a user because otherwise they just clicked enter and it didn't change pages. Yeah, the web, I can't, <laughs> right, exactly. But they, they don't know why, right? They're just trying, they're just trying to type it in and it keeps breaking. Um, so uh, yeah, so let's go ahead and go back to our, our code. Um, we can, yeah, we'll, we'll wanna add that here into our file. No, that's right. And go ahead and then let's go back to our controller. Um, now we're awaiting the response. Now, the only problem with the flow of this right now is we check the database if there's a person and then we insert someone. Um, now that may not be a problem because maybe the first thing we want to do is check if they exist. And then if, if there is a user and we, we get a response, um, then we'll want to do something, right? We'll want to say, hey, uh, res.send status um, something like 400 or some 404 um, bad request where we want to say hey this user's taken you know maybe we do want to do something like that this is where we start I mean now we know how to write queries this is where we can start having fun with like uh, we're just building a backend and we're testing those endpoints and making it what we want, right? And that's that's it. That's all we're doing here. Um, so yeah, but what we're talking about right now is an if statement, right? We want to write an if statement where we say if users at index zero is an empty array, then do this, you know. Otherwise, we want to return like, you know, if it has stuff in an array, then we need you to move on uh, and make a new request to us kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, you could write it right here. Now users will be an array of two indexes, right? Index zero will either be empty or it will have stuff in it. So if it's empty, what does that mean? Boom. up to you. Um, remember, if you do 21, 
it's not going to, I mean, it will insert the user, but it's not going to return the user's information. Um, I wonder, uh, one of my questions that I would have is, do you know if you, you could Google this to find out, can you return information after inserting information with Postgres? And sometimes it might be insert into Postgres might help as well. Hey, there you go. So there's this returning, there's this returning keyword and they're specifying a row or a column, sorry. Um, you could do maybe returning, try returning splat. If you want to return everything, you could try that. Just do the returning, just add returning splat at the very end of that query and see if it works. Uh, the sequ uh, this is, uh, sorry, put returning on the end of the 21 query, right? All the orange is like the your query, so b before the semicolon, because the semicolon ends your query. Yeah, so you'll want to add the keyword returning and try the splat after and see if it returns everything. Now, we can test this without doing our if statement and just see if it works. Um, yeah, it's because of line 20 currently. You have an incomplete if statement. All right, let's try to hit it and see if it works. So we're expecting everything from the user, um, right, that we inserted is kind of what we're expecting. Boom. Oh, heck yeah. I love it. Yep, that's right. Yeah, before before we even run that line 21, right? That's why it's gotta be in our if statement. But 19, we want it run before our if statement because that's checking. Um, now, you don't, now remember, returning splat, we're specifically adding that to the end of an insert query. All the insert into is cared about is inserting. All the select, all from is carried about, or, you know, worried about is getting stuff. So you have insert, which is inserting, and selecting, which is getting everything. So returning all really isn't going to do anything for a, a select all because it's we're already grabbing all of what we want. <laughs> Great question. What do we do? Um, we need an if statement saying hey, if users at index zero, in fact, let's just write an if statement, uh, how it should be written. So if parentheses, curly braces, uh, after the parentheses, sorry. So if curly braces, or sorry, if parentheses, curly braces, else curly braces, right? After, uh, so else goes after the curly braces. So what we're saying is if this is true, whatever's inside your parentheses, run this, else run this. Yep, 
just like that. So users is either going to be filled with stuff or it's going to be an empty array. Now this is if you're doing the if the the it's inside the parentheses is where it's evaluated, right? The what we're evaluating. And users at index zero because this uh, this will be an array of two indexes, right? So users at index zero is either going to be an empty array, or it will be a uh, an array filled of a user, right? An ID, a username, and a password. So if if users at index zero is something, then Perfect. Yeah, it it's gonna be a it's gonna be a res dot send, and it's gonna send something back to the front, um, and a status. It will we'll send a code as well. Now, um, this depends on what how what do you want to evaluate? Depends depends the position, right? What are what is your if statement gonna say? Because currently it's saying if users at index zero, then this. Now, what does that mean? Well, it's what it's automatically going to do if you just have that is it's wondering if users at index zero is a truthy value. Now, does that sound familiar at all? Well, it's really basic. Um, just Google truthy values and falsy values, and there's not very many. <laughs> um, JavaScript, yeah, there we go. And JavaScript, yeah, we'll want JavaScript stuff. Oh, and they're gonna go all nice. Um, so, oh, scroll up, um, yeah. Internally, JavaScript sets a value, one of seven. Yeah, well, these are, um, they're talking about equal signs, and uh, it, it's not, like, basically, certain things will be truthy or falsy, but this is really what I look at. The values that are always falsy, right? False will be falsy. <laughs> uh, negative zero, null, undefined, non, um, an empty function, and then these are truthy values. So this is the important thing for ours, is to understand that no matter what happens, index zero is going to be truthy, right? Because it's not gonna return non, undefined, null, an empty string, minus zero, or false. It's gonna be an empty array, which is truthy, right? So we need to figure out a way to trigger this as a truthy or a falsy, right? Because we need it to trigger, oh, this this is false or this is true. So if we say, um, if we say, if we use triple equals and we say, hey, if users at index zero is equal to an empty array, then we will have a true or a false to that, right? But currently, this will always be truthy. Line 20, we will always run the first parameter, uh, you know, that first argument. We will never trip 23 currently. I don't. So if you could explain it to me, like I just... I've never gotten those down.
Hmm. Okay. I like that. Hey, it sounds great to me. That's really easy way to understand it. Awesome. I love that comparison. Let is the double equals and const is the triple equals. I love that. That's so good. Well. So, so does this, uh, so the users at index zero will either be like, you know, it's either going to be an empty array, which means that there's no users with this username. Or it will be an array filled with stuff, which means there is a user with this username. Right? I think pick the empty array. Yeah, pick the empty array, I think. It's the easy, it's the low-hanging fruit. So users at index 0, if they're equal to triple equals to an empty array. So inside the parentheses, right? So we're saying if if this is triple equals equal to an empty array, what do we want to happen? Um, now, now if it's an empty array, we want to insert, right? We want to return. This kind of flips everything where it needs to be, kind of thing. Well, actually, this is this is actually exactly what you have now that I'm thinking about. It. So you can cut 25 and paste it into 21. Or 25 through 27, sorry. Um, you can cut all that out and paste it into 21 now. No, in 21. Yeah, it's got to be inside the curly braces. And then let's return line 21. So it, it just, it doesn't run. Uh, you see how you have the return statement on 25. We'll just stick return in line with 20. Yeah, 21. Uh, uh, no, just put the return keyword in front of t SQLize. Yeah, just uh, R and U got mixed. Awesome. So this will basically ensure that our if statement doesn't hit two responses. It's just going to hit this one code block and it will be done. It's not moving on to the next code block as well. Um, now, instead of return this username, we need to say res.send. Um, to send this string. Uh, oh, sorry, 25. Yeah. In line with your return. Because after, after line 25 is nothing. Nothing will happen. Yeah, so res.status. And then you can send a status code of 400. You do not want 200 because that means that everything's okay. Yeah, so 400, send, and then bring that together with this is... Um, no, um, you could... No, I would just send the, what you have, this string. This username is already taken. Yeah, that works. And then just get rid of one of those parentheses. Yeah, there you go. Awesome. Shall we test it?
currently it's just showing up in the response. It's not showing up on the front end because we don't have a front end technically. <laughs> Mm hmm we should get that message and if we just change like one letter we should get our whole user back too right oh no worries no worries and again if you want to change that it's uh, IAN and you could change it to AIN uh, again, it's spelled wrong. Uh, it's A-I-N. Yeah. There you go. Yep. Um, let's see. Uh, check your database in PG. Uh, yeah, hit refresh. Okay, good. Uh, let's go ahead and ch take a look at our uh, value at user at index zero. Let's go ahead and console log it. Uh, users at index zero above our if statement though, right? Because we want to just see if it's getting equal to an empty array for some reason. So let's go ahead and try to hit this endpoint again. Right. You can just undo. There you go. We're getting an empty array. Try getting rid of the return statement. I wonder if it's killing it halfway through for some reason. Uh, the No, no, the, yeah, that. Just get rid of it on 22 for now. Let's try it again. I wonder if for whatever reason. Okay, we've, re we've, so we hit this the same thing again. We something we could try is we could try flipping them and just see what happens. That would be weird. But see, the weird thing is index zero is equal to an empty array. So why are we getting? You know, another thing that we could do is we can say uh, users uh, index zero dot uh, ID in the if statement. So I'm just thinking that for some reason, because this is an array nested within an array, that for some reason our if statement is saying, hey, this isn't equal to an empty array. So what I'm thinking is, 
for some reason it's it's just not working. Uh, try one equal sign. I'm just curious. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, now try sending it again. Broken. <laughs> uh, okay. Interesting. Yeah, scroll, scroll up. What is the error we got? Okay, we got the duplicate error. Because it ran the first one again. All right. So this is my thought. Um, you know, like I said, there's other ways to... There's other ways to pass in, to, to check if an if statement. Right now we're trying users at index zero is equal to an empty array. Well, we know that if it returns something, right, then it should be, there should be a, at index zero, there should be a dot ID, right? There should be a dot username and a dot password. So let's just evaluate users at index zero dot ID. And if that is truthy, which would be, um, yeah, and then just get rid of everything else, like the equal uh, array, because now we're just evaluating, hey, does users at index zero have dot ID? If not, it, I mean, if that's false, then we do the first thing, or if that's, if that's true, we do the first thing, we need to flip it, I think. Hmm. And it shouldn't have worked the first time. Try running it again. Hmm. Try changing. Wait. <laughs> I'm confused. Try Michael, someone that is taken. And this will throw an error. Oh. So we're hitting the second one. Well, let's talk about the logic. Let's let's figure out the logic before we test it. So we're saying if users at index zero dot ID is truthy, then create this. If it's falsy, then return this. Now we Well, we've tried it before, and it hasn't had a problem before. So it shouldn't. Yeah. Yeah. What if we did... Um, What if we console logged before, because we have a dot then and a dot catch and our, our catch isn't hitting, but what if we console log our dot then inside of our dot then um, on the same line as res.status, but before res.status, say console.log, uh, uh, sorry, on 23 inside of the anonymous arrow function before res.status, go ahead and console log db res, uh, capital R. Yeah, it's probably because, uh, go ahead and put curly braces around everything, uh, this whole arrow function area that we're in. Uh, no, it, before C of console, put curly opening, and then at the very, uh, before the last parenthesis, though. Yeah, right there. There we go. 
And then, um, I think it's because it's on the same line. I'm confused as to why this is. Uh, go ahead and hit enter after res, put them on two different lines maybe. Yeah, there we go. Uh, because, so arrow functions, you can have an one line arrow function and a curly brace allows you to do multiple lines. Um, but yeah, basically we're running two different commands. So the arrow functions, like, I don't like you doing two commands on the same line. So, um, so what we're testing here is, is our, for some reason, is this being hit? Um, so we should get, we should have an error here for Michael, right? Because one ID should exist when we hit this. Um, yeah, let's try Michael. Because if we do Michael, ID should exist. So users will have an ID on it. Yeah, so there's that. But we didn't hit our, our uh, dot then statement at all. I'm just confused why our if statement isn't working. Yeah, no, your if statement's fine. I'm unless I'm mis unless. It Unless I'm mistaken with, um, I normally don't use dot then and dot catch, but I don't think those are the problem. Um, I really don't think those are the problem. Here, let's just try something. Um, the only difference between an if else statement and a ternary is the if and the else are gone and replaced with with something else. So get rid of if and else, just the, the words. Yeah. And then and then instead of else put a sem or put a colon here. Uh, not a semi, sorry, a colon. Yeah. And then after go to where if is, get rid of if. And then after users that that parentheses uh, for the users dot ID after that parentheses and before the curly put a question mark. And this is a ternary. Yeah, let's see what what's breaking. No, it's breaking before we even do that. So let's take a scroll up. Oh, uh, instead of curlies, do par uh, sorry, do parentheses instead of curlies for the ternary. So you're gonna do yeah, yeah. Get rid of anything that's yeah. Those those blue curlies. Get rid of those and make them parentheses. And then, yep. That's weird. Why is it not liking that? I mean, you could always get rid of all the parentheses altogether, <laughs> but um, let's try it. Let's get rid of the parentheses. Let's get rid of around users, around the code blocks, and we'll just have, uh, just put a enter after the, the user dot ID. 
We'll space it all out like that. Yeah, and then get rid of the parentheses here. And then 27, get rid of those. And see if it likes that. Uh-huh. And it's just a colon instead of... And then get rid of 29. Yeah, it doesn't like our uh, ternary at all, which is weird. It is very strange. That's why we had the curlies. So our if statement isn't listening. It's not. It's not playing nice. Hmm. Yeah, it's a it's just an if then statement, right? Or if else. <laughs> yeah. So uh just hit undo and let's go back to our original syntax. Um let's just go back to the if else. Keep going. There we go. And we can get rid of the console log even. Keep going back. Because it's not, it's not that it's not running it. It just doesn't like what we're evaluating at all. Okay, so new users work, and then if we tried using an old user, go back to Michael, try running Michael in this. So the, pro so the problem, go ahead and uh, cancel. The problem is it, it's running line 22, which it has no business of running. <laughs> um, we could we could change, so what works? Hmm. Creating a new username, which says that index zero is a empty array is equal to an empty array. Yeah, well, create a new one real fast, and we're console logging it on 20. So if you create a new one, uh, yeah, yeah, like make a new person. Awesome. And then just send that. So you'll see in our terminal here, we have an empty array. And we executed both functions, right? Because the first function on 19 fires, it grabs everything from Joe. So users at index zero on line 20 is an empty array. Our if statement says if users is an empty array um, is equal to an empty array, that's true. So it should return SQLize.query, insert user, all that jazz, which it does. And then we res.status200.send db response at index zero, which we see in Postman. Now, the problem comes in when we try to send this again, users at index zero, let's go ahead and send it again. 
Now scroll up in our terminal here. Uh, oh, make it bigger so we can see there's a scroll. Yeah, there it is. So scroll down just a bit more. So we have Joe, it's, uh, if you look in the middle, so we have index zero, it's actually above, it's, uh, it's, you're right, it's on the screen still, it's Z9, which is yellow, yeah. So this is the index zero, when we ran that query, right? So we executed select all, and it has at index zero an array of objects, or an array of a object, right, one object. Um, and this is users at index zero. Wait, user at index zero is an array. It's an array of an array. Try, I think we're not drilling right. Um, try doing on line 20, do index zero. You see how you have square bracket zero? Do square bracket zero after that. Mm hmm. Yep, because we have an array of an array, right? Because currently, my problem is at index, at users at index zero is literally equal to an array, which is a problem. Um, it's a problem because it's not, it's not currently equal to an array. Um, yeah, let's try hitting Joe again. Uh, yeah, let's, let's go for it and sc scroll all the way down. Okay. And then let's scroll back up. See if we can find that. There it is. You see now it's just an object. Users at index zero at index zero is just an object. Um, so ID nine. You see how it doesn't have the square brackets around it anymore? It's just got the curlies. <laughs> well, basically what say what I'm saying is now if we said dot id it'd be equal to something. So whereas before it we weren't really doing it right. So let's try let's try evaluating uh, index zero at index zero dot id just by itself. So um, yeah in our if statement. Uh, no it, it's just uh, basically our console log what we have in there the users at index zero index zero uh, copy that, paste it in the if over everything else. Yeah, in there. Um, and then dot ID. And then get rid of the extra users word there. Awesome. So what we're saying is, hey, now we're dr drilling in to see if the ID property exists. If it does exist, and it's truthy, then we're going to return this, which isn't exactly what we want, right? It's it. Um, we should flip this technically, but right now let's just see if it works. Um, all right. So, so it should be. So what is it giving us back? Uh, in probably the so it seems like the database is still trying to be run yeah because it's like it's giving us that constraint error which means the database is attempting to be run here 
Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So this is my last thought on this one. We've tried many different things. We're digging into it properly. My only thought is to change up our, like our kind of our dot then dot catch. Um, but before we do that, I think we should just take a break for a bit and then come back to it. Um, we've been at it. We've been at it for like two and a half hours. So, um, Uh huh. Yeah, that that totally works. And feel free to write more routes if you want, because like I said, you're this is the start of your your backend. So there's logging in, and you can do if you go to your index.js. I don't know if you're planning on working more today, but um, you see you have your app.get and your app.post. This is where you're gonna write your route, so you can comment out like. Just on line 12, you could put forward slash slash write a route for logging in, write a route for adding an item to to watch, write a route, you know, and just write. You can literally write all those actions out here and then walk through them and build each one out individually. Uh, I think for your app, it was like adding, you could add items to your account to watch, right? Yeah, yeah, this is basically your features. This is what your routes are for, right? Anything that needs to be saved to the database. Oh, same. Same here. All right, man. Well, I will catch you tomorrow then. My pleasure. I'll talk to you later.